Hey, welcome back to another episode of Keepin' Cozy. Today I'm speaking with famed investor Jim Rogers. He's best known for co-founding the Quantum Fund and the Soros Fund with George Soros. But outside of that, he left the world of finance to go travel the actual world at age 37. He writes about this in his best-selling book, Adventure Capitalist. I hope you enjoy this conversation and please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you do. Thank you guys for all of your support and I hope you enjoy. How's it going with you? I'm fine. You can hear me. You can see me. Yeah, yeah. Everything's going uh, going well on my end. Okay. So, uh, okay. so my first question is: uh, Could you talk a little bit about your life uh, from you know growing up in Alabama and then going to places like Yale and Oxford and the transition that was like for you? Well, that was a shock. It was a huge shock. It was an accident. I grew up in a place, uh, Jacob, where my phone number was five. And that's not a typo. It was just one five. So you can imagine when I got to New Haven, I was in shock. Well, they were they were they never saw anybody whose phone number was five. And they, I think that's how I got accepted at Yale. Anyway, yeah. I, I, I had to uh, I couldn't go back. I, I couldn't fail. So I worked hard and had fun and I got a scholarship to Oxford and had an enormous amount of fun at Oxford and didn't fail there. And so it, it was a lot of fun. It was a gigantic change, gigantic shock. I learned a lot. I have told my children, you can go to uni if you go to university, you can go anywhere you want, but you must go far away from home because the best part of my uh, education was <laughs> going far away from home and learning that many people did many things differently and had many different ways of thinking. Yeah, yeah. And was there a bit of a culture, you know, you kind of alluded to a bit of a culture shock, but could you like elaborate a little bit about what was it like being, you know, a kid from Alabama in, you know, Yale with all of those elites, you know, types well, of you just You just said it. Uh, I was from, uh, I, I literally knew nothing of, about the world. Uh, my phone number was five and the nearest town was 50 miles away and it had 50,000 people or 20,000, 20,000 people. Uh, that was the nearest city. So it was really a remote backwards place uh, with not much exposure to anything. We, we had television in those days, but television, there was only, only three channels, I think, two or three channels. And so, um, you know, I didn't even, the world was not a lot on TV. There was not a lot of exposure to the world. So I, I literally knew nothing about uh, the world outside the small state of Alabama and small parts of the state of Alabama. Um, yeah. I didn't know how people dressed. I didn't know how people talked. I didn't know what right. people did. I didn't know about the food. I didn't know about anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then what was it like for you to go from that, you know, person towards getting into investing? I know you mentioned uh, in previous interviews that it was a bit of a, you know, like it just kind of happened through chance or by luck. Well, it, I went down one day at Yale uh, in my senior year because companies used to come in to interview and I thought I should do that for the experience. And hey, who knew? And one guy I liked a great deal and he liked me. He happened to work on Wall Street. I knew nothing about Wall Street. I knew it was in New York. Uh, I knew that something bad had happened in 1929. I didn't know there was a difference in stocks and bonds. I thought they were the same thing. Uh, so yeah. I knew nothing about investing. I'd never invested, never thought about it. I certainly read about the crisis of 1929 and the depression we all had, but I, I had not a clue. Uh, but I did quickly fall in love because this was a place where they would pay me to do, yeah. to know what was going on in the world. And that's what was my passion. I didn't know when I was 21 years old that that was my passion. I mean, I can look back and from my life and what I read and thought about it. And, and studied was what was the world and what was happening. Uh, but when you're 21, you don't know a lot about yourself or anything else. But I did find out, and it certainly I strongly urge everybody, if you can figure out your own passion, that's what you should pursue. As I said, I didn't even know that was my passion. I didn't know enough about myself or life or the yeah. world to know that that was my passion. Uh, I now know, and if there's anybody looking at this, if you don't, know what you want to do, then sit down and try to figure out what your passion is. And that's what you should pursue, no matter what anybody else says. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you um, originally got into investing, I know you did a lot of work with George Soros. What was it like when you first uh, started to work with him? 
well, I mean, we we were both we loved we we had a pile of money in the room. We had to do something with it, and so uh, I, I was trying to find things to invest in that would be successful. Uh, that's what everybody on Wall Street does, I think, in the investment world. They're trying to find things that will make a profit, and there I was scrambling around trying to find things that would be successful. And fortunately, I found a lot. Yeah. And what was it like for you to go from Alabama to start, you know, making money in the investment world? And I guess this was probably at least at the start in New York and then other places. Well, I didn't have any money when I started, which was a problem. Uh, you know, when I when I went to Wall Street, I had a secondhand Volkswagen and a wife. Those were my assets and my liabilities. I sold the Volkswagen and got divorced, and uh, there I was with virtually nothing. So I didn't have much money to invest in the beginning. Uh, actually, I did save some money and had a great, great, great success early in my career. I tripled my money in like five months when everybody else around me was collapsing. And so I thought, this is really easy. This I'm going to be I'm going to be Bernard Baruch. This is, wow, yeah. I'm going to be fabulous. But then four months later, I'd lost everything. You know, <laughs> I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. I didn't know nearly as much as about myself or the market as I thought I did. It was a great, uh, a great lesson. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you mind just talking a little bit more about your relationship with George Soros? Was, you know, were you guys always, you know, buddies, or what? What makes for a good investor relationship? Jacob, you're, you're, you're talking about 50 years ago. Uh, I, you might as well ask me about my first wife or where I went to college. I mean, we we both love the investing world. Um, he was a great trader. I was apparently fairly good at research and finding ideas, and I loved what I was doing. I would I would have worked. 80 hours a day if I could have uh, on the research. It was so much fun and traveling around, finding ideas. And he was good at investing and, and market timing. So it, it worked. But you, you're talking about something decades ago. So yeah. I say, you might as well ask me about my first wife. <laughs> I told you, I divorced her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, I don't then... remember too much about her. <laughs> Well, then I guess maybe you'll remember a little bit about when you left the investing world and you went on, you know, the adventure you talk about through adventure travel, travel adventure capitalist. Uh, do you mind going a little bit into into that? What it was like leaving? Well, all my life, uh, and I had, had no clue what I was talking about when I was a teenager. I used to talk about I want to see the world, uh, and I always had that in in my brain. Again, that's one of my passions. I didn't know enough about myself to know that I meant it, that I was very serious. But uh, I always wanted to go and see the world, and retired at 37 with the idea that I was now going to see the world, and what I want. What I wanted to do was go around the world on a motorcycle because the motorcycles are exciting and I wanted to see the world. Unfortunately, it was impossible in those days. There was the Iron Curtain, Red China, all of that kind of stuff. But I set out trying to pursue that goal. And in the end, I finally got permission to ride around Central Europe. I got permission to ride around uh, China. So I'm mean, in the end, I got permission to go across the Soviet Union, which was the last piece of the puzzle. It's a very big piece if you look at a map. Soviet Union was gigantic. But I finally got that piece too and off I sat. It took what eight or nine years later, nine or ten years later before I could do it. Uh, but I did it. That yeah. was the goal. Yeah. And well what was it what was it like uh, leaving leaving the investing world? Did you have any apprehension? No, not at the time. Uh, I had made a little bit of what it was. It's not so much money now, but at the time, it was more money than I could ever conceive of having in yeah. my life. Uh, as I say, guys make that much in a day now or in a single trade. But uh, I was thought I had a, enough money to last me the rest of my life, and I wanted to have more than one life. I didn't want to wake up one day at age 75 and people would say, oh, boy, he was a great investor, and that's all he ever did. No, I yeah. wanted to have more than one life. A passion, another passion was to have more than one life. I literally wanted to do as many things as I could and see as much of the world as I could. Now, of course, a lot of my friends have a lot more money than I do because they stayed and worked and worked and worked and worked. But I've had a lot of adventures and a lot of lives, and that was what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about would be um, specifically, do you have any advice for talking to strangers who you meet on these kinds of travels? Uh, <laughs> 
well, my main advice is do it. Figure out a way to do it because the more people you meet, the more exposure you're going to have and the more you're going to learn. And you will probably teach them something too because many people, you know, many places that I, when I first motorcycling across China, they'd never seen foreigners. They'd never seen white people, Americans. Oh my God, he's an American. You know, it was a shock to all of these people just seeing a Caucasian American shocked a lot of people so my advice is if you can't figure out a way to do it even if it's just ask for directions or something ask the time of day because the more you can engage with other people the more you will learn and the more they will learn yeah yeah well so i guess you know your writing kind of touches on you know an ever-increasing world and it kind of falls under the umbrella of globalism and one of the things, you know, you know, we've been th- talking a lot about on the podcast is just how students' lives are going to change a lot due to, uh, you know, increased globalism. Do you mind, like, giving your thoughts on how you think a student's life will change? Well, Jacob, first I wanted to tell you that the world always is changing and it always has been. You pick any year in history, everything that people thought was wrong 15 years later. doesn't matter where, what year, 1900. Pick 19, 15 years later, everything they thought in 1900 was totally wrong. 1930, everything yeah. people knew was right in 1930 was wrong in 1945. So I pick any year. So when you ask about change, uh, the f- most important thing you need to learn is it's changing and it's not going to stop. And if you want to adjust and succeed, you better figure out the change and adapt to the change. So I can tell you what I think is going to happen. I know, first of all, the most important thing, whatever's happening now in your life and whatever you know in the year 2020 is not going to be accurate in 2035. It's going to be totally different. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, we all, um, you and I are talking over the internet. That's obviously a gigantic change which is taking place. It was already happening, but crises always accelerate accelerate any change which is in place uh, my kids do uh, get education over the internet uh, that could could have done that 10 years ago but the, this virus has caused that to accelerate ordering food etc all of this yeah. conferences all of this is being accelerated it's been around medical care over the internet is going to change i mean you don't have to spend all that time in doctor's offices anymore just go, i mean you can't do heart surgery over the internet but they can do a lot of things over the internet so everything we have known as far as communication or communicating or interacting is going to change very quickly and dramatically yeah yeah uh, so, you know, I kind of want to ask, have you ever read the book Things Fall Apart by Ch- Chichua and Chibe? I have not, but I can tell you it's right. <laughs> well, <laughs> If they say things, things fall apart, they're right. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the key themes in that book is there's a resistance to change with, like, you know, traditional cultures. So in that book by Chibe, it specifically talks about, you know, the change that happened in Africa, the Igbo tribe. And how the, you know, there were somewhat outworn practices that, you know, were kind of bad. Like there was like, you know, killing twins and stuff like that. And then, you know, these Christian, uh, you know, uh, kind of like colonizers took over and they changed things. And there was a bit of resistance, but overall it led to perhaps a better, you know, tribe. Do you think that that kind of, you know, ethos is happening in the United States with a resistance to the eventual change that's occurring? (laughs) Well, as, as you just pointed out, there's often, in fact, nearly always resistance to change. Uh, that's why uh, people who are, that's why people are called iconoclast, you know, because <coughs> they come along and say, God, let's do something different. You know, Deng Xiaoping in China came along in 1978 and said, we got to try something new. <laughs> this is not working. And of course, a lot of people were against it. In fact, Deng Xiaoping, Mao Zedong had put him in jail for a while. Because it was, it, they thought he was strange with these new ideas. So of course it's happening in the U.S. Uh, Donald Trump won the election because he resisted. He was against a lot of the changes which had taken place in America and would take place in America. Uh, 
people are called conservatives because there's a good reason. And I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to be against uh, ch some change. Some things are great. Some great tra traditions are great. Some religions, many people live and die by their religion. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter. It's good for them and good for their nations and good for their societies. So, the, but my basic point is it's going to change. Is it for the better? I think it's for the better, but many people resist it strongly. That's, they have wars, they have persecutions, they have, you know, they have pogroms because they don't want change. But resisting change is not wise. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the second half of the podcast specifically focuses more on student advice. Uh, one thing that I found pretty interesting, you know, while watching your lectures was what you thought about philosophy and history being the best majors to study in college. Could you talk a little bit about why you feel that way? Well, they were the best for me, Jacob. What the, the best major for anybody is what you love. If you love pottery, invest in, and major in pottery or art or something like that. For me, it was phenomenal because history taught me that the world is always changing. I told you before about 15 years. Um, yeah. That history is exciting and interesting and wonderful for me because it taught me about the world, but it taught me also that the world is always changing. Uh, philosophy, I, I studied philosophy at Oxford. I was not very good at it uh, at the time. Later, I, I said, oh, now I know what they're talking about, you know, and in later life, I started started sinking in and I started, but it teaches you to think. Uh, it teaches you to think whether you like it or not. And if you're going to adjust and be successful in life, you need to be able to think. Most people yeah. look at the TV or the newspaper or the internet and say, well, the sky is blue. Well, maybe it's not blue. Maybe you better think about it. Maybe you better go look out the window. Most people would just say, well, it says here in the paper, the sky is blue. They won't even go look out the window. So it teaches you to question, to think, and to come to your own conclusions. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, you kind of, uh, in one of these lectures I watched, you said that practical majors like accounting and finance aren't necessarily the best for people who want to study business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, in my mind, they're not. Uh, I mean, I, account, I taught myself accounting. You know, I'm not necessarily very smart, but it's accounting's pretty simple stuff. Assets, yeah. liabilities, you know, income, expenses, things, debt, things, assets, things like that. One can sort out and figure out. Now, if you're going to be an accountant, if that's your passion and you want to be a CPA, then of course you've got to go deep and take a lot of courses and get certification. But if you're going to have businesses or life or be an investor, most of it that you need, you can learn yourself. Uh, but if that's your passion, Jacob, for goodness sakes, do it. I never took an accounting course in my life. But I do know enough accounting, plenty of accounting, to have had a, a big a, a success on Wall Street. A lot of which is based on accounting. If you don't understand the numbers, you should not be investing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, kind of on on the topic of investing, how do you know if you're a good investor when you're at the age of you know 21, 22? Well, I didn't know. I knew nothing about it. I, I quickly realized, oh, my God, this is fun. This is what I want to do. And I even thought I was good for a while until I told you I lost everything, uh, totally everything. Uh, but and when I first went to Wall Street, Jacob, I assumed everybody was there who was, you know, they were educated, they were experienced. They must know a lot about what they were doing because of the circumstances. Well, quickly. I figured out, no, they don't know what they're doing either. They don't know much more than I do. They know yeah. more than I do, but not much, not enough. Uh -huh. So I realized that everybody has to figure it out themselves. Uh, and there's more than one way to be a good investor. I knew a guy once who had more than one guy. They were fabulous traders. They were short-term traders. They buy them, sell them, buy them, sell them, buy them, and yeah. sell them. Uh, you know, if they held it for a week, it was a long time. Uh, I was turned out that I was terrible at that was not any good at short-term market timing. Uh, my, my strength, if I have one, is to find something that's very cheap where there's enormous change taking place 
and investing and staying for a long time. But there's more than one way to be a successful investor. I had no idea of any of this. I had to learn. I learned the hard way by observation and experience. I guess you could go to university or somewhere and take some courses. Yeah. But I don't think that's going to teach you. Yeah, and you've mentioned I think once before where if you only had twenty, if you could only make twenty investments in your life, people would invest differently. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, statement. Yes, yeah, because everybody, every, Jacob, everybody wants a hot tip. Everybody wants to be rich this week. This week, just give me one hot tip. Well, hot tips are very dangerous. Uh, if you want to be successful investor, you stay with what you know. And everybody watching this knows a lot about something, whether it's sports or cars or fashion or something. You look at it every day. You go on the Internet. You read about it because uh, that's what you love. Well, when you see a change taking place that you know is going to be successful because you know a lot about that, then do more research and, and make investments. That's how you become successful. As, I, as you said, if you can only have 20 investments in your life, you're not going to make many investments. You're not going to be jumping in, jumping out, listening to hot tips, you know, watching something on TV and making a foolish investment. Just stay with what you – it's boring. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear it. Everybody wants a hot tip to get rich this afternoon. But that's the way to be successful. Yeah. Unless, yeah. unless you're one of those people like uh, those guys I mentioned before who are very good short-term traders. I, I, Roy knew the guy I used to work for. He didn't know what IBM was, but he could sure trade IBM stock. <laughs> if you yeah. ask him or the manager or what the products were, he knew very virtually nothing. But he yeah. could buy and sell that stock. Yeah. So, you know, the final thing I want to talk about is you alluded to the fact that, you know, you and your family have left America and moved to Singapore. Could you talk a little bit about why you think Singapore and Asia is the move? Okay, we are, we are still Americans, by the way. Uh, yeah. I wanted my children to speak Mandarin, uh, and we were doing that in New York, but it quickly became evident that, uh, just one second, happy, uh, baby, baby, it quickly became evident that if I was serious, that I was going to have to have my children in a place where they didn't have any choice. Um, sure. I cannot tell you how many people, hundreds of people who told me, yeah, but when they become eight or 10 years old, they're going to stop speaking Mandarin or German or Spanish or whatever you were trying, whatever the parents were trying to teach them. Because uh, it's not cool. It's not cool to speak Chinese when everybody else is speaking English. And I realized it was true. I looked around and I saw uh, hundreds of people told me, oh gosh, our parents taught us Spanish and we hated it and now I wish I'd stayed with it or Chinese yeah. or whatever. So I realized if I was serious, and I was, that I had to take them to a place where they had to speak uh, Chinese. So we moved to Asia but so that they would speak fluent Mandarin and so that they would know Asia. I mean, Asia is going to be the most important part of the world in their lifetime. So it was very simple to make sure my children are prepared for the 21st century. Yeah. Can you just elaborate for the last question why you think Asia is going to be the most important place to live? During, you know, well, our generation. Well, Jacob, look out the window. It's already happening. You don't know. You don't know that China's gone from nothing in 40 years to the second most, uh, the second biggest and most important economy in the world. You look at India, you see what India is doing. I mean, it's a second, second to contender, if you ask me, but it's certainly having yeah. gigantic change. Korea, many places uh, in Asia, uh, Siberia gigantic changes. There are huge resources. There are over 3 billion people here. Lot, not a lot of debt like there is in the West. The West is chock full of debt with many demographic problems, etc. Um, and Asia's on the rise. Yeah. Jacob, I mean, we, if you read history, you realize that China and India, most of the time in the past few thousand years, have been the number one countries in the world. Uh, it's only been in the last two or three hundred years that the West came to dominate things for a variety of historic reasons. Well, China's on the rise again, whether we like it or not, uh, and a lot of people don't like it. But China is the only country in world history that's been number one three or four times. Uh, no other. Great Britain was great once. Rome was great once. Egypt yeah. was great once. Well, yeah, China's been great three or four. China's also collapsed had catastrophe three or four times. 
But for whatever reason, you know, China has turned around after a few decades or a few centuries and risen to the top again. Yeah. You remember what Napoleon said about China? Napoleon is what, over 200 years ago, he said, when China wakes up, you better be careful because it's going yeah. to be very, very significant. And I don't know how he knew. Uh, I, I learned by visiting and seeing and reading history. Yeah. But for whatever reason, it's happening again. Asia's got three billion people, not a lot of debt, huge work ethic, great emphasis on education, great emphasis on discipline. My yeah. goodness, they discipline their children, Jacob. Nobody in your class was disciplined. Uh, maybe you were, maybe you were, and maybe a few of your classmates. But most American students and children are not disciplined. But in, in Asia, they are. Yeah. Well, do you think the West is doomed? Do you think like because of the debt and all of the political instability, kids are going to have to leave the United States? Well, they don't have to leave. They can stay and adapt, but they better learn to adapt. You better learn self-defense and a few yeah. because uh, history shows that every time a nation or a society has gotten itself into this kind of problems, there have been uh, crises or semi-crises. I, I'm not sitting here trying to give you doom or something. I'm just telling. Look at history. The the one of the, I tell you the main lesson of history, Jacob, is people do not learn the lessons of history. <laughs> history is very clear, but most people either don't know it or ignore it or think Mr. Trump thinks he's smarter than history. For instance, most people do not learn the lessons of history. The very very clear lesson of history is that debt and and the problems, the kind of problems you just emphasized have always led to problems down the line. I don't particularly like saying it, but the country which has been on top normally does not stay on top forever. Somebody yeah. else rises again. Then how do you know, as someone who was who seems to have the ability to get over that resistance to change, how do, what advice would you give to students who, you know, kind of have a resistance towards change? I'm trying to teach my daughter how to be to ask questions, to question everything, not to believe anything she reads. Here's my daughter right here. Hey. You can speak to him in Chinese if you want. Uh, she speaks uh, perfect Mandarin and perfect English. Uh, I'm trying to teach her and her sister to question everything, to think independently. It's not easy. It's certainly not easy. It's very easy to see on the television what they say and say, well, that's the way it is. It's yeah. not. It's not the way it is. It's very easy to watch American or China, any TV. They will give you a good story. My lesson to her and to you and everybody else is to question that because it's going, to, it's probably not accurate. First of all, nearly all governments put out propaganda and it's not accurate. First thing you need to learn is that every government and every TV spews propaganda. You need yeah. to question. First, you need to understand that. Second, you need to learn to question it. And once you do, you'll, you'll go back and look at history and say, well, is it destined that America is always going to be the number one country? Never has been. Maybe yeah. history, maybe history is wrong this time. But and to be prepared, you, you don't have to leave. I mean, Great Britain 100 years ago was the, the most, the number one country in the world. There was no number two in 1920 after the First World War. Not even America. America was rising, but it was, not, it was nothing compared to Britain. Since then, I mean, Britain's still there. There's still people having fun and having, uh, making money and success. But it's nothing, nothing compared to what it was 100 years ago. And yeah. look back at any country in history, and you will see that that's the case. It's always changing, whether we like it or not, especially when you spend more money than you have. You get overextended mil militarily, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you can stay and adapt. A lot of people st stayed in, the, in Britain, didn't leave, had success. Yeah. A lot didn't. A lot went to the U.S. Yeah. Huge numbers of English immigrated to the U.S., uh, in the past hundred years, and most of them made the right decision. Yeah, but some stayed. In, the Beatles didn't leave. <laughs> the Beatles had a good time. Yeah, in, in the UK. Yeah, so well, you, yeah. Well, thank you for your time, Mr. Rogers. Um, I don't hold you more than those thirty minutes, but and sorry for the Skype issue at the start. No problem. No problem. I got to run. You can see my daughter's dying to get me out of here. Hey, thank have you, a good Jacob. one. Thank you. Let me know. Bye. We'll do it again if you want. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Have a good one.